Hello. And uh, this week, <clears throat> we uh, celebrate a second feast. You remember that last week we celebrated the Solemnity of the Most uh, Holy Trinity. Uh, this week, we celebrate the long title for the uh, feast is the Solemnity of the Most Holy Body and Blood of Christ. Now, a tradition developed uh, shortly after the celebration of Trinity Sunday of on the Thursday following that, to remember the gift of Jesus' body and blood given to us for our life. Now, certainly the tradition remembers that the institution or the beginning of that occasion began on the night of the Last Supper, which would have been, of course, Holy Thursday. Throughout the years, uh, different traditions have also arrived around the Holy Thursday celebration. Not only did Jesus take bread and, and uh, give it to his disciples and take a cup and give it to the disciples, although remember that those words are inclu included in what we know the synoptic gospel tradition. The fourth gospel does not mention that, rather at the Last Supper mentions uh, Jesus washing the feet of his uh, disciples and encouraging them to do the same. <clears throat> also, tradition would say that at the Last Supper, um, what Catholics consider to be the priesthood was uh, instituted, although <clears throat> whether or not that really, and I have to be careful here because we don't want to mix theology with the scripture, was uh, the point of uh, what happened there. Anyway, all of this is to say that on Holy Thursday, our emphasis is uh, directed to the coming passion of Jesus. Um, and it somewhat suppresses the joy of the gift of what um, Jesus is uh, doing on that occasion. So with that in mind, this Thursday, that is the Thursday I mentioned, um, was considered to be an opportunity to celebrate the uh, <clears throat> uh, gift of the body of Jesus in his body and blood. Now, this uh, tradition develops, and it has a kind of interesting history. So first of all, that's why the Thursday was the chosen date. But in more recent times, because not too many Catholics uh, come to Mass on a Thursday, it has been transferred to this coming weekend or to this coming Sunday. All right, traditionally it went by the Latin name Corpus Christi, but as I say, in more recent times has been given the longer uh, title. It began, uh, as best we can see, in the 13th century. That would be already in the 1100s, so it would be in 1191. A Juliana of Liege was one of the first to kind of ask for the celebration of this. And uh, then it was uh, uh, a pope who uh, uh, fostered this a few, few years later, as uh, it, would be, it would be in 1264, the pope was Urban VI. I'm sorry, Urban IV, got to get the right number there. And, um, he asked uh, one of his contemporary monks, uh, Thomas Aquinas, to write the liturgy for the celebration of Corpus Christi, which he did. And he composed one of the most uh, beautiful and well-organized of liturgies that uh, perhaps uh, we have seen in, in, in our long history. He wrote not only um, a mass text, but he wrote a text for the celebration of the monks at the various different times in which the office was uh, publicly uh, celebrated. So it was a very inclusive uh, work that he produced, along with some very significant uh, hymns. Um, perhaps the, the most famous is called the Panja Lingua. It turned out to be a se sequence 
We spoke earlier on about sequences. Uh, this is one of the four approved sequences, but because of its length, will probably not be used in this weekend's uh, liturgy, although you may find it in, in the text or the books that, that you used. Coming out of this, he wrote two other hymns that become very popular, one called De Tanto Mergo, which uh, is used for the celebration of the benediction of the Blessed Sacrament, and the other, O Salutaris Hostia. So he is very artistic and uh, both theological in his, in his works. So I give all of that background with one further, that as uh, time went on, between the years 1849 and 1969, a separate feast in honor of the most precious blood of Jesus was observed. Um, it was usually observed on the first Sunday in July, and in some cases was uh, celebrated on the first day of July, July 1st. But in 1969, that feast was removed from the calendar of celebrations and added to because, and that's the title of the feast we celebrate now, the most precious body and blood of Jesus. And the purpose, certainly, of this teaching is to um, emphasize the real presence of Jesus when the sacrament is um, celebrated. All right, so all of that is a little bit of background for why this uh, feast originated and its importance in our Catholic uh, tradition. The readings chosen for this particular um, time, first reading comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verses 2 and 3, and verses 14b to 16a. The second reading comes from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 10, verses only cup 2, 16 and 17. And finally, the gospel comes from the sixth chapter of John, verses 51 through 58. Now, the sixth chapter of John is known as the Bread of Life chapter, okay? And uh, it, it is used very often. We have mentioned before that in the year of Mark, which is the B year, um, six weeks are dedicated to uh, kind of developing that particular chapter uh, during the months of uh, August or J late July and August of that year. So all of that, again, is a little bit of um, background. Now, why are the, and how are the reason, readings chosen? First reading, and remember what we're looking at here from now on in this part of our discussion, is really the biblical background. We need to choose readings that support or illustrate or help to develop the doctrine that we are uh, considering. As I mentioned before, it is a little more difficult uh, when we're talking about doctrinal positions, perhaps to choose readings that reflect that. Remember the doctrine of our belief in the Trinity was the last time, and now our doctrine or our teaching about the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist is also a doctrine, but we therefore need to take uh, illustrations from the scriptures that will help us uh, appreciate this. So the first uh, reading comes from the book of Deuteronomy. Now, again, a little background about the book of Deuteronomy, which technically uh, means a second telling, or uh, Deuteronomy was called a copy of the law, and basically, the book is made up of three addresses which are given by Moses on the plains of Moab as the Israelites are ready to enter into the Promised Land. One remembers that for various reasons, Moses will not enter with the Israelites into the Promised Land, but before he goes, he gives, I suppose, what we would say his farewell address, or he gives his um, kind of exhortations as to what they should do and what they should be careful about. 
So the book of Deuteronomy is really divided into three uh, sections. Uh, chapter 1, verses 1 <clears throat> through chapter 4, verse 43, makes up his first address. The second is, verse, is chapter 4, verses 44 to chapter 28, verse uh, 68. Uh, so that's the rather long section of this talk. And then the third section is chapter 29, verse 1, to chapter 30, verse 20. Now I give you um, all of that uh, as, as kind of a background, picturing Moses as kind of talking to the Israelites as they stand at the threshold of coming out of the years of wilderness and uh, now being ready to enter uh, the promised land. On the first day of the 11th month, and this is where then we find that uh, Moses, who by the way, dies in Moab and his tomb, so the stories go, and that would be in the last little section, um, which we have to smile. How does he know that he dies and is buried if he is still alive doing it? So you can see that a little bit of editorialing went on uh, at, at this particular point. Chapter 8, which is where the selection that we're given this time comes from, is central to the book. Moses has been reminding the Israelites of the law, Lord's protective care during the 40 years of their desert sojourning. And that, in fact, in some ways, as they were wandering there, he had been testing um, their ability or willingness to obey. You remember that the reason for the 40 years wandering had come from the fact that early on Moses, when they had come to the uh, entrance to the Promised Land, had sent scouts into uh, Canaan to check it out. The scouts had returned by saying, yes, it is a land that is productive, will allow us to find enough food to, uh, to live, but also it is inhabited by a number of tribes and they are hostile, we believe, to Israel. And so the <clears throat> scouts, um, there had been uh, 12 of them, traditional number. 10 had said, we can't do it. They're like giants. We, 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 we can't enter. The other two, Caleb and um, Joshua, had said that we could. But because of that, um, Israel was then doomed or condemned or sentenced to 40 years of, of preparation to enter the land because then the thought was that this generation of Israelites will die out, a new generation will come, they will accept uh, the teaching and uh, the willingness to enter the Promised Land. So again, all of that is background as uh, the book of Deuteronomy was composed. Moses reminds the Israelites, and here's the section we're looking at, that in the wilderness years, God had provided for them both food and drink. There had been stories of uh, their complaining about the lack of water, and they had tested the Lord at Meribah, and there had, remember, water had come from the rock. But the food, that the Israelites had been nourished with in the uh, desert years was known as manna. Now, what, uh, the word manna, by the way, translated means, what is it? Okay, now you can kind of uh, take that phrase and uh, determine its meaning perhaps by the tone. It's like maybe mom makes, uh, and this is not in the scripture, but maybe mom makes some new food and sets it down in front of the children. And of course, um, in typical nice way, say, mom, what is this? Or they say, what is this? And so there's a kind of condemnatory <laughs> or uh, aspect. Well, that's a little bit the way in which the word manna might have been understood was Israel saying, what is this? Or what is this? It's certainly nothing that we have eaten or had before. And um, what we are aware of 
is uh, something of the makeup of this manna uh, that, that appeared. Now, you probably have uh, heard this before, but um, what it was was a sweet, sticky sap of a tree that had been passed on through the bodies of insects. So it's, uh, uh, you, you can find it in the wilderness, and they did find it. And that is what the, the manna was. Um, remember that they were told to gather enough of it uh, in the morning when it would appear, because that, and then by uh, when the sun rose and it got warmer, uh, this would evaporate. So they were told, take just enough for one day, don't except when uh, you had the Sabbath come up, then they could take uh, two days. Now, what, the manna. God fed Israel and the manna, so the stories went, fed them throughout the wilderness years and then disappeared when they entered into the Promised Land because there they could grow uh, their, their own food. Why is the manna story, um, and I give all this little background, uh, presented for this Sunday's or this weekend's uh, observance because the manna is the bread of heaven. So it is called bread and of course becomes a, a typology or what we call a type of the Eucharist. So we can see in the manna, um, Jesus in one point says, you ate the manna which came down from heaven, you ate it and you died. I will give you a bread which comes down to heaven, which you eat and will live forever. So the uh, analogy of the old manna, the wilderness, the Israelite manna, and the new manna, who is Jesus, is uh, clearly there. And Moses, finally, by the way, as he uh, gives this this is a little part of this larger talk that I mentioned he gives. And I have to smile, I think, because on another occasion, he is pictured as giving it at the water gate, now wherever that was in the wilderness, and that it began in the early morning and uh, ended uh, in the early afternoon. And everyone paid attention. Uh, no little kid had to go to the... Uh, facility, um, no, you have to smile, it was the perfect uh, audience and the perfect attention, just like you pay to, oh, never mind. Um, so um, Moses, therefore, reminds the Israelites that God had given them of the food they needed, that God had fulfilled his promise, and that as they entered the uh, land of promise, they should keep that in mind. All right, so all of that is choice of the first reading. The gospel, now this comes at the conclusion of a uh, discussion that had begun, as I mentioned, uh, this is called the bread of life uh, section, it had begun after Jesus had fed, the story had, uh, Chapter 6 had been inaugurated with Jesus feeding a large number, you know, the 3,000, the 4,000. And um, then uh, Jesus had moved to, from wherever he had uh, been performing this action, had uh, moved to Copernicum. Now, Copernicum, of course, in generally recognized, was the headquarters of Jesus' teaching. And it might be important to notice that uh, the next verse after the one that we hear this time says that this teaching of Jesus came in the synagogue in Copernicum. So it was a teaching that Jesus was giving to a group. Now, who would have been in the synagogue but uh, Jews, obviously, and therefore, there is, as always uh, uh, I've mentioned before, a certain tension in the fourth gospel with regard to uh, the, the Jewish community. Now, if Jesus is teaching in the synagogue, he might also be using 
a pattern known as the Midrash. Now, the Midrash is an interpretation or an explanation of a biblical text, and the idea of the Midrash is to apply it to life. Now, um, the Judeans would have read the Torah, that is the law, in the synagogue um, with the understanding of Midrashic interpretations taking place. In fact, at a certain point in, and even in Jewish life, as you know, the Torah is read in the synagogue. It has been divided up into 150 sections, which are read separately over a three-year period. Interesting, in our own uh, choices of liturgy text, we have somewhat followed um, that pattern. So all of that, and again, I give this as a little bit of a background because uh, it is true, and uh, here we need to, I need to be careful, that what we are believing as Catholics is that there is the real presence of Jesus, body and soul, um, in the uh, Eucharist as we celebrate it, and that the words of Jesus, this is my body, this is my blood, now, we take this, and I have to be kind of clear here, I, I think, that our teaching rather literally takes the words of Jesus, unless one eats my flesh and drinks my blood, they do not have life within me. So I would suggest that we have when we think of the real presence of Jesus, there is a unique reality of Jesus' presence when the Eucharist is celebrated. I would also say that it is symbolic, but the problem here in the using of the word symbolism is that it has taken on different meanings and understandings. Often when we speak of a symbol, which means to stand for something else, if that's the understanding of Eucharist, then we miss the, the point here of symbol. Symbolism, as it developed in our early uh, tradition and is used by such a great thinker as Augustine of Hippo, that symbol stands for the reality of what it is. So, to say that the bread and wine are the symbol in that sense might be considered or should be considered as correct. In other words, just to, for an example, if we say that bread stands as a symbol for life, well, it's more than just pointing to life. It is, by its very self, bread, life-giving, sustaining. See, so that's what I mean that a good symbol uh, uh, like this does what it says. And so when we call the words of Jesus, take my body, drink my blood, is real, the, the, the symbol does what it says. It unites us, it joins us with the person of Jesus. So as I say, this becomes um, you know, uh, we, we need to simply be a little bit careful here. And I, I pause a little because I know this is a very important teaching of, uh, of our belief that there is this real presence of Jesus. And um, it is uniquely something that occurs at the time that the community gathers around the table of the Lord, remembers what the Lord did at the supper, remembers now the words of Jesus that are here um, in, in our um, celebration. Also in the text that we hear, there was a dispute that broke out among the Israelites, um, or the Jews rather. Now, who are these Judeans? Well, they would be those who are listening to the teaching of Jesus in that synagogue, who uh, said, how can this be? How can this man give us his body to eat and his give us his flesh to eat. Well, um, see, here is where an important, I would suggest, sense, understanding 
of the term symbol um, needs to be uh, in place. Is Jesus therefore interpreting something? Well, there, um, that might be the case too, if he is certainly a respected teacher, a respected, and remember, this is a teaching of Jesus given where? In the synagogue, in Copernicum, to a group of fellow Jews who would uh, certainly understand, and here's my concluding point on all of this, would understand all of the imageries and background that are at work in what his teaching uh, is. Um, so that section is what we are given to uh, consider th this uh, time. Uh, fine, uh, let me just conclude by going to those couple words of Paul that we find in his letter to the Corinthians. It's not clear here why he places the cup of blessing uh, before the bread. The cup of blessing, and um, this was a common Jewish expression for a cup of wine that was taken at the end of a meal. Now, one remembers that in the Passover celebration, there were a number of different cups um, which were you drank during this meal. The third cup was called the cup of blessing. And before it was broken, a blessing was said over the meal. So again, keep in mind that Paul certainly is himself was, grew up in Judaism, was a Jew, understood uh, Hebrew customs and practices. And so that too um, is behind uh, the words or teaching that Paul is saying here. It is by sharing the cup that is blessed that one participates in the blood of Christ. Now, we have noticed on another occasion, keep in mind that blood here is also a very, very powerful symbol of life. Think about it, notice this, I'm sure. Blood, you go to the doctor, takes your, um, gives you a little report, takes a sample of your blood, can tell you a lot about you. But certainly, blood is life-giving. Therefore, when we say it is the symbol of life, well, it's more than just pointing to, to life, it is life-giving itself. And, and so if there's a, a kind of hope out of some of our reflections this time, the importance of understanding symbol in the ancient uh, world way, the way in which early thinkers reflected on it, because, you see, when we come later on to the Reformation period, that sense of symbol was lost, and that would raise a lot of questions about what we call the real presence, because not all of our Christian sisters and brothers accept our Catholic uh, teaching with regard to the real presence, as do um, many of our Lutheran uh, traditional sisters and brothers, but others do not. So. Um, if we take something away, it might be the beauty of the importance of a uh, uh, symbol. Now, in the Middle East, eating food was important because it established, as you remember, a bond of companionship, but at the same time created mutual um, obligations. So, as we uh, this time wonderfully celebrate and remember the real presence of Jesus with us, with the community, as it gathers around the table, and um, uh, devoted traditions, the blessed um, of benediction, the blessed sacrament, reservation of the blessed sacrament. All of these are added uh, kind of customs that have uh, divided us, or developed rather, uh, among us. But let me uh, let us conclude perhaps today's reflection by also noticing, as I mentioned, that we have mutual obligation, that the meal only goes so far when the host breaks the bread and shares it with those who are seated at the table. 
That's why it's important for us to share the body and blood of the Lord. They are the powerful symbols of the presence of Jesus. And um, so as we gather this weekend, we are grateful for this marvelous and important gift that God in Jesus gives and renders to us. Thank you for being with us. Hope to see you again.